been in a series um, in the book of Acts, and uh, we're heading into chapter 3, and let's start with reading the first eight verses. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Uh, I've, been exciting. I've been excited to get here. So now we have the first healing in the book of Acts. As you probably know, during Jesus' ministry, he was doing um, signs and wonders. That's something he did, a number of signs and wonders. Um, but... The most common sign and wonder that he did was healing people. And Jesus said, um, Jesus said, when I leave, you're going to do greater things than me because I'm leaving. In other words, I'm going to be this spirit that is alive in me. I'm going to be giving to you. And that's how the book of Acts begins. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Just as the spirit of Elijah was transferred to Elisha, which we considered, the spirit that rested upon Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has been now given to the church so that the ministry can continue. And so now we are seeing it. Um, quick little review, quick little review of where we've been, because it's important. We're, we've been kind of building a house here, so to speak. There is power promised. In the beginning of the book of Acts, you receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. And we've taken our time to consider what this is. And we've been very intentional about first explaining how this is first and foremost an internal power. The Spirit of God filling our hearts so that we may know the joy, know the love, have confidence in our salvation to be filled with the spirit of hope, the God of hope, to overflow, to know the love, to know the love of God, to be comforted in this love. What did Jesus say? My joy, my joy will be in you, and your joy will be full. This is the internal power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of the filling of the Holy Spirit, knowing the love, the assurance of salvation. We spent a good time there. And we'll continue to speak on that. But we also spoke about how this promise of power is also an external manifestation. The way Jesus said it, you're going to be clothed with power. And we see that playing out. We see it here. In, with Peter's words, there is a man who is lame and he gets up. There's external manifestations. The verse that I put on the screen numerous times from Hebrews chapter 2 says that God testified to his gospel with signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So gifts meaning different things that we, we do by the power of the Holy Spirit. This serves to testify to the gospel message. And that's what's, that's what's definitely happening here. So um, something that I have been doing in myself And something I've been trying to lead us as a church into is we're trying to take this box off of the shelf. It's been on the shelf. It's been collecting dust. And we take the box off and we open it. And there are verses. There are scriptures that we've kind of put in a box because we haven't totally known what to do with them. There's a lot of those scriptures that this box contains. Uh, One of them I mentioned earlier when Jesus said, 
you're going to do greater things than me because I'm going to the Father. Here's another one. There's a time when Jesus sends people out um, with a certain amount of authority over disease and, and demons. And there's one time where they have a problem casting out a demon and they say, Jesus, why? Why couldn't we do it? And he said, because your faith is too small. But I tell you, but I tell you, if you have faith like a mustard seed, a tiny, tiny bit. If you have even a mustard seed of faith, you can speak to this mountain and you can say move and it will be uprooted and it will move. And hear this, as it was spoke to me this week, nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you if you believe. That's one of those verses that we just kind of put in that box. Or, or, or what we do is we intellectualize it so it loses its power. You know what I mean? Where we have our, our intellectualizing explanation. Oh, it means this. It means this. And now it doesn't challenge me anymore. It no longer calls me out of the boat. Out of the boat, that's a reference I mentioned last week. It's also been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, Peter and the disciples are sitting in a boat, and there's Jesus walking on water. And Peter says, Lord, call me out to meet you. And Jesus says, come, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat. And I've been thinking about that. And you know, what do the rest of the disciples do? They saw Peter get out of the boat. At first, when they heard Peter say, hey, call me out to, to walk on water too. Well, they just kind of sat there silent. I bet they were kind of a little annoyed. <laughs> That's what I think. I think they were kind of annoyed. Um, like uh, when David showed up, and, he's, and he heard the taunts of the giant, and uh, David had faith, and David wanted to go and fight this giant. You know, his brothers, who did not have such faith, they kind of got a little ticked, you know? Even said, you're conceited. You know, your head's getting too big, Peter. Or your head's getting too big, David. As in, challenging people to step out of the boat can sometimes be a little scary because we're comfortable with our... Lesser faith. We're comfortable with that. And sometimes we have to be prodded a little. And one of the ways that scripture prods us is lots and lots of verses that say, according to your faith, may it be done for you. Um, believe. Peter, he stepped out of the boat, and you know what? It wasn't perfect. He did walk on water, but then he heard the sound of the wind, and he saw the waves, and he did get scared. And he started to sink. And, and Jesus said, why did you doubt? That's, I feel like, a word for us. Like, why do you doubt? Don't doubt. Don't doubt. And if it's not perfect, it's okay. I was also reminded, uh, Cheryl uh, brought this up. I thought it was very interesting um, how Jesus, there's this one time where Jesus prays for a man for his eyes to be opened. And... He was blind, and the guy's like, okay, well, I can kind of see, but people now look like trees. And Jesus is like, okay, let's do it again. And Jesus prayed a second time for him. I don't know what to make. Why did Jesus need to pray twice? I mean, I would really think that Jesus' first time praying would have done the trick. But on this occasion, Jesus had to pray twice. I don't know. But it's kind of a, something that encourages me in the say, sense of like, hey, uh, let's give it a try. That's something else Cheryl's been saying. I'm going to quote her a lot. <laughs> uh, sometimes faith just means giving it a try, stepping out of the boat, or to try something out of our comfort zone. And I, and, I, and, I, and I realize that some of the things I've been saying lately around here have been calling us out of our comfort zone, and I'm going to continue to do that because it's been happening to myself. Really, it really has. Some of these verses, if you believe nothing will be impossible for you, it's been speaking to me, and I've been trying to put it into action. Oh, I had a conversation with my brother this week. God's doing something. I had a conversation with my brother this week. You wouldn't believe it. Actually, you know what? Save that. There'll probably be time. I'll probably tell you. But God's doing something, even, even in my own life. This week that pertains to this very thing. And I feel like this is happening in part so I could speak about it to all of you and that our faith could be encouraged. So I'm going to hold that story for now. I'm going to pray. We're going to dive into this passage. Father God, increase our faith, increase our faith, increase our faith so that, so that we too can operate with the fullness of you 
Holy Spirit living in us, working through us, manifesting yourself for the purpose of glorifying yourself and showing the gospel to the world. Um, increase our faith, Lord, and guide my words. And let, be, let it be evident, Lord, that I am speaking on your authority and not my own, Lord. Uh, in your name, Jesus, amen. Okay, uh, where shall we begin now? Well, let's just look at the passage. Okay, so uh, they're carrying someone. He's lame from birth, lame to the point of he needs to be carried. And, uh, uh, and uh, he gets healed by Peter. Now, oh, here's another one of those verses that we often just keep in that box collecting dust. It's a New Testament verse. comes from James chapter 5. It says, the prayer of faith will heal. The prayer of faith will heal. Um, but that's not precisely what's going on here. Because, you know, uh, if someone came up to me and they're sick and it's like, hey, uh, let me pray for you. Totally legit. Again, the prayer of faith will heal. That's one of the things. James chapter 5 but that's not exactly what's going on here because if you notice, Peter didn't actually pray, did he? <laughs> um, instead, he just said, look at us, and uh, in the name of Jesus, get up. <laughs> there was no prayer in that. And all that to say, sometimes there's a prayer, sometimes it's just in the name of Jesus, get up. All that to say is when it comes to the working of the Holy Spirit uh, in the book of Acts and in the Bible, you can't over-formulize it, all right? Uh, I don't know if Chris McCooey's floating around here, but me and him talked uh, for an hour on the phone yesterday, and Chris is a scientist, and I like to think of myself as a science-minded person. I like to know how things work. And me and Chris have spent a lot of time actually talking about um, the working of the Holy Spirit and gifts of healing and faith, and really the question of, like, how does it work? What are the, what are the spiritual laws that we can do what are, the, what are the steps to bring about successful healing or answered prayer? And on one hand, there are certainly spiritual principles, and that's why I talk a lot uh, about these things. But at the same time, I want to caution us against trying to over-formulize the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a person, and everything that happens happens in relationship in relationship to him. Jesus, when he called Peter, he's like, come to me. It, was, it wasn't just by your faith, go walk on water. It was come to me. This is a walking with God. As I've been thinking about this, there was one time I was taking my dog for a walk. We have a new puppy. He's uh, mostly St. Bernard. He's kind of wild. Um, and he really doesn't do great on a leash. I've been working on that. But, he, you know, he's strong. He's St. Bernard. And, uh, and I either have to pull him or he's pulling me down the street. And it's like, heal, heal. I want him to heal. And uh, anyways, I'm thinking about all the miracles in the book of Acts and the faith that, 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 that heals and the faith that moves mountains. And I'm thinking about how to do it and, and how we can see these things. And um, trying to figure out really the formula, the formula to get it right with God. And my dog was frustrating me so much. And finally, I felt like God was speaking, and I saw it. This is, this is what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I'm trying to walk my dog and teach him to heal. I don't want to have to pull you, and I don't want you pulling me. I want to walk, and I want you to walk. Just, just walk with me. I want you to walk right at my side. Just follow me. And here it is with God, walking with the Spirit. Follow me in relationship. Follow me. And if you're walking with me by faith, you'll be ready. You'll be ready when the lame beggar is there asking for something. Your faith will be ready. Your faith will be ready to heal when the time is to heal, to speak when the time is to speak, to serve, to give, to love. You will be ready. But what you need is to walk with me in relationship. That's why we're focusing on this, this internal, first, this internal power, which is all about relationship and knowing the love of God. And from that, from that, uh, then, I, then I wanna see all of the things that you see in the book of Acts. But because the Holy Spirit is a person, 
and he operates according to his will, it's not always the same thing in the same way. And on this occasion, again, it's not a prayer. Instead, it is just Peter saying, uh, um, in the name of Jesus, walk. Well, actually, first he says, look at me, look at us. Now, here's something else when it comes to healings in the Bible. A lot of the times, the healings that you read about in the Bible, they are signs. Uh, Not just signs that testify to the power of the gospel. They are definitely that. But they're also signs about what healing really is internally. The external healing is very often a sign of the internal healing. Okay? Uh, uh, let Let me explain. So here, Peter and John, they see the guy and they're like, Look at us. That's the first thing they say. Look. Look. And, you know, you can look at various scriptures. Psalm 34, those who look to the Lord are radiant. They shine. Uh, John chapter 6, Jesus said, It is the will of the Father that everyone who looks upon the Son will have eternal life gifted to them. That's the will of the Father. Or the most, you know, famous... Bible verse, perhaps, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the verse before that, uh, Jesus says, this is just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And without getting into that whole story, what it was was they were sick and, and Moses held it up and their, their task was simply to look. They were sick, look. Just look at it, you'll be healed. Look. And that speaks to how easy, how easy our role is, our task is when it comes to the salvation that is offered to us. It is simply a matter of looking. Just turn your head and look. Now, of course, this doesn't literally mean, you know, your head and your eyeballs when it comes to salvation. The looking means something else. It's a looking of the heart. It's just turning and looking. Um, And you see that kind of in the next verse when he says... Or, or the second part of it, he says, uh, so the man, you know, Peter said, look, look at us. So the man gave them his attention. Hear this, because this really is what it means to look when it comes to, to the call of faith. So the man gave them his attention. Hear this, expecting to get something from them. <laughs> that is actually the faith that God wants. Looking to God, expecting to receive A question that people often ask themselves is, what does God want from me? Um, How does God want me to serve him? What does God want me to do? What does God want from me? Wrong question. Because you're not the giver, okay? You are actually the beggar here. It's not, what does God want from me? It's, hold out your arms. It's, the question is, what does God want to give me? What does God want to give you? Um, Now, I very much, I very much want us to see the faith of Peter, to be inspired by that, to, to... call upon and say, get up and walk to the the lame and to heal the sick. And I, I, I want all of that. I want us in that way to identify with Peter and his faith. But before we can identify with Peter and his faith, first, we need to identify with the lame beggar. Because that's first where all this comes from. First, it's a matter of holding out your arms holding out your arms, and receiving. Um, You know, there is this one time where, like I I mentioned it earlier, Jesus sends out people and he gives them the authority over sickness and over demons and such. And they come back and they're like, they come back and they were like, this is amazing. (laughs) I mean, I can imagine. They're like, this is amazing. I mean, the people we pray for are healed and people who are oppressed cast out demons. This is is crazy. This is awesome. And Jesus says to them, rejoice not because the spirits submit to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written on the book in heaven. 
In other words, what he's saying is, let the joy of your heart be the salvation you have, not the power by which that manifests, but, but, but let it be in the fact that you know me. Again, going back, it's about the relationship. It's why we spend so much time first considering the internal work of the Holy Spirit baptism, knowing the love, knowing the joy. This is where real power comes from. First, we need to be that, that lame beggar who just is looking, wanting something, expecting something with our arms open. Lord, we're here to receive. And you know what happens to him? He's healed, and what does he start doing? He starts jumping, not just walking. It says he starts jumping around. <laughs> I love that. He's, been, he's never walked his whole life. He's been lame since birth, and now he's jumping. It speaks to the internal joy. He's praising God. This ultimately is what this story is really about. As much as I want us to be Peter, first we need to be the lame beggar with arms open, ready to receive, believing. We're looking to God because we want to receive something, and we believe. We're expecting, that's what it says, expecting to receive something. That is the right attitude, looking to God, expecting to receive. Hallelujah that that's how it works, right? That we just show up as children, and he is the father who gives the gifts, and we're the children who receive them. It's a wonderful truth. Um, okay, so verse 9 when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. All right, this is where it's just like, this just speaks to me, and this just almost just messes with my head. Because this is really uh, something that is so much a desire of mine. The people are amazed, naturally. That's what signs do, okay? Part of the signs and wonders, that's what they do. The people are amazed. And there is certainly a place for that. Uh, Jesus said, if you have trouble believing, this is John 14, I believe. If you have trouble believing, believe on account of the works, Okay? Let the works get your attention. Let the works testify there's something here. Um, anyways, so the people are amazed. Of course they are. But verse 11 is, is really what speaks to me. They're astonished, and they came running. What do you mean came running? They came running to listen. What's going on here? What does this mean? This is repeated in the book of Acts. Um, when Philip who's not an apostle, who's just a regular Christian, you know, when Philip gets to Samaria, he's performing signs and wonders, and everyone says with one accord, they all paid attention, they all turned to ear and they listened. They came running. So much, so much of what I feel is in our context, this is what's lacking, all right? Um, as in the world is not paying that much attention. And that is why that is why I desire the power that seems to be promised in the book of Acts and the, the, the patterns that lay out. The, the miracles, signs, wonders, healings. Yes, Jesus healed people out of compassion. Absolutely. But more so, it was for the greater mission. Okay? The signs were just that. They were signs that were to point to something. It wasn't just to point to the, the healing. It was to point to the message. Because the external healing was a sign of the real sickness, the real healing that we need, that we all need. And that's the salvation. That's being restored into relationship with God, where he is our father and we're his children, and we walk with him. That is, that is the message of healing by which we all need to hear. And, oh, they came running. Why is that not happening now? This is, just, this is why, let's say, like it messes with, with my head a little bit. Like, uh, has God decided that he no longer wants that kind of attention? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just not the God you read about in the Bible. The God who said, this is how you pray, hallowed be your name. That should be our desire. Hallowed be your name. Show yourself. Show yourself. Let your name be held high in honor. Hallowed be your name. And so I think, like, I think crazy thoughts. I think crazy thoughts. We're, we're, we're streaming live to YouTube and Facebook right now, right? Okay. 
Um, if, if anyone is blind here, they can come up. We'll give it a shot, you know? Um, what I'm trying to say is, that would probably get the attention of the world, right? Like something documented, and not like, not like a, I've seen like videos of like these hokey things that, that don't really impress me and someone is claiming a healing. I mean something of that sort, okay? A documented, blind person, why not is the question I'm asking. I, I realize that doesn't really usually happen on Sundays. I get it, all right? And, and there are things happening in our midst, don't get me wrong. Oh, I talked to a woman not that long ago, uh, uh, Leslie Furholter, because I heard the story and I couldn't even believe it. I don't know if Leslie's here today. I couldn't even believe it. Uh, the doctor sent her home to die. I mean, she had stage four cancer. Doctor said, there's nothing more we can do for you. I heard the story. I went and talked to her because I needed to get it verified. Okay, because I'm like, this is amazing. Doctor sent her home to die and they said, there's nothing, nothing else we can do for you. And uh, they referred her to some experimental study at the university or something. And so she went to this experimental study. Meanwhile, the church was praying. I've talked to people who were praying during this time. She goes to the experimental study. And before the study begins, they say, first, we need to do a scan to see where the cancer's at. And you know where the story's going. Cancer's gone. It's gone, okay? That was some years ago. A lot of you guys already know that story. It was new to me, but it's like that sort of stuff. That sort of stuff where it's like documented. And now she said the doctors and the, the, the people over there, you know, they call her like the miracle, the miracle person or whatever. And she said it's Jesus who did that, okay? You can bet that people are talking, all right? So I know it's happening. I know it's happening, but I want more. I want more. We're streaming to YouTube, okay? I want something documented on camera. This is, this is just where my mind goes. And some of you might hear that and be like, oh, that's kind of, it's kind of a lofty thing to want. No, 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 no. Jesus, call us out onto the water. We want to walk. Why not? It seems to be his character. It seems to be what he wants. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Um, anyways, all that to say is join, join with me wanting that, okay? Don't say to yourself, oh, that, that, that's, that's just for back then. No, no, no. Oh, one more. You know what? No, I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. I have more to say, but I just need to keep going. All right. Uh, we'll come back to it because I have more to say on that topic. Um, so when Peter saw this, everyone's running. Everyone's running. Of course they are, and they want to hear. Peter saw this. He said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith, in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Okay, I love this. I love this. He starts with saying, why does this surprise you? How's that? How's that? Why does this surprise you? As in, you know the miracles that Jesus was doing, most notably raising Lazarus from the dead. The whole city heard about that. So now we are doing it in his name. Why does this surprise you? This is small compared to the miracles that you know that he's done. Don't be surprised. Of course this is happening. How is it happening? In his name. He says, by faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. You see that a lot in the Bible. By your faith, may it be done for you. Your faith has healed you. Where faith is very much connected with healing. You can't get away from it. Can't get away from it. Very, very linked many, many times. Now, faith in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? The name. Now, on one hand, okay, part of that, it means for his reputation, for his namesake. Again, the first Part of our Lord's prayer is, hallowed be your name. Make yourself known. Make them know your name. Make them know who you are. They don't know who you are. They don't know your 
power. They don't know your goodness. Show them. It says, in his name. In his name. Um, it means that. Um, it means more than that, though, when it comes to us. Because Jesus said, you're going to do greater things than me because I'm going to the Father. And again, his spirit has been placed upon us. In his name also speaks to the concept of authority. Do you understand that? Someone knocks on the door and they say, I come to you in the name of the crown. You know that they come with a certain degree of authority, right? Not complicated. We, hear this, this is some of the stuff that will challenge you, it challenges me. We have been sent by him, commissioned by him. You know the Great Commission. Um, go and make disciples. What does he say right before that? I've heard it said this is the most important part of the Great Commission that's often overlooked. The first part of the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Therefore, go and make disciples. That is the power by which he is sending us out. It's something to challenge you. It's something to think about. You know, when you pray, when you pray for your marriage, when you pray for your spouse, for your children, for your neighbor, when you pray for the sick, who is it that's praying? Beloved, understand the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Power. Why power? Well, here's something. Here's something that's been on my mind and pertains to this whole conversation. Judges chapter 6. God shows up to this dude, Gideon, who's kind of a, a, a frightful character. He's, he's kind of a Kind of a scaredy cat is what's going on in the context. Don't have time to get into it. And he says, mighty warrior. And Gideon's like, who are you talking to? You know? And he says, God is, is with you. And this is what Gideon says. And this really re resonates with what's been on my mind. Gideon says, if God is with us, then where are the wonders that our ancestors told us about? Oh, man, is that not... Is that not what I've been saying? I read about this stuff. They came running. I hear stories. It happens today. I know that. But I still say, where are the miracles that our ancestors told us about? More, more. Because as of yet, the people are not running. They're not. So anyways, Gideon says, if he's with us, then where are the wonders that our ancestors told us about? And this is what God says to him. Have I not sent you? There is a power that is certainly unleashed in understanding the authority by which we've been sent. I'm the one sending you. I'm the one sending you. So when you pray, know that. You are praying on behalf of one who has been sent. By who? Oh, by God, the king. Sometimes we just don't know the authority we have. I don't, I don't know why I thought of this. Sometimes something happens to you and it's like the smallest thing and you, know, you don't even think about it for 20 years because it really doesn't mean anything. But then as you're thinking about things, you remember things. Okay, that's the life of a preacher anyways. But anyways, <clears throat> um, I was thinking about something that I don't even know why. But so my dad, after he retired like 20 years ago, he took a, a chunk of his retirement money and with a bunch of buddies from the YMCA, he bought a cheesecake factory in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is known for cheese. It's called the Wisconsin Cheesecake Company. And uh, anyways, um, I knew they had a freezer full of like imperfect cheesecakes. And I don't know, my dad's like, oh, you can go get some or whatever. And I remember like showing up at this factory and there's like the factory worker and I'm just kind of like, uh, yeah, my dad said, uh, there's some cheesecakes. I was hoping I could uh, get some cheesecakes, maybe. I don't know, I, for some reason. Uh, and anyways, uh, I remember uh, the four person, uh, she was like, well, your dad's the owner, so you can pretty much, <laughs> your dad's one of the owners, so you, you can pretty much just take whatever you want. <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, I guess that makes sense, you know? <laughs> um, 
where there is a certain amount of authority that is commissioned to you by who you are and who sent you. Isn't that the case? That's all I'm trying to say. Doors open. A lot of times when we pray, we pray as if we're the scaredy cat Gideon who doesn't understand that we've been sent by the Most High God. We've been commissioned. And as long as his mission is our mission, okay, just because I wear the badge, if I'm going and doing my own mission, there's no real authority. But if we're seeking him and we're seeking his namesake, by all means, when we pray, when we walk, when we live, we should do so as one who has been sent. There's power there. Um, let's just go to the next passage. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you act in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So the way that the apostle Paul preached to the Jews was different than the way he preached to the Gentiles, because the Jews had a a huge amount of Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Jesus and his resurrection. And it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about preaching through the Old Testament. When you see these things that were written down long before Jesus, it bears witness to the fact that God has been planning this from the beginning, and the more you see it, the more amazing it is. But whether Paul is preaching to Jews or Gentiles, the summary message is the same. The point is the same. Um, repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come so that you too may receive the promise for the promise is for you and for your children and for all of those the Lord calls. You will receive the Holy Spirit. You will receive the spirit of joy, the relationship with God. You will know the love. It's the same point. The, the, the miracles, the power, it serves this message. This is the message that we hold up, and this is the message by which the people came running. Okay, uh, I, 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 I'm almost done, but uh, hold on a second, Cheryl. I started this, I kind of referred to it, I'm gonna come back to uh, uh, something happened to me this week. I've been trying, I've been trying to put this into action. I've been trying to let these words challenge me and to pray with the faith that believes. To not just pray, but to pray as one who is sent. And my family is not believers. I've been praying for them for a long time. Um, my older brother, uh, never thought he got, he'd get married. He got married uh, a couple years ago. Never thought he'd have any kids. His wife got pregnant. It's so exciting for the whole family. Um, but the baby has had a problem. The baby uh, um, talked to my brother on the phone, and he's real, real anxious. I uh, talked to him, this was a month or so ago. He was really anxious, telling me uh, both of the baby's kidneys in the, in the ultrasound, they can see that there's a significant problem. Both of them are uh, severely dilated, and they don't really know what's causing a blockage. And they say it's likely the baby's going to need surgery um, when, when he's born, and they might have to induce... And he, he said he, they're not really saying everything. The doctors aren't really telling me everything, but I can tell it's serious. And, you know, he's reading everything online and worrying and such. And, and I, I actually told them uh, about some of the healings that have taken place in our midst. And I told them God can heal. You know that. And uh, I prayed with him. Um, and I just encouraged him to put his trust in God. And... 
three or four days ago. Uh, so a month later, my brother calls me up. The baby's born, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago. My brother calls me up, and he's like, um, he's like, well, I just got back from the doctor. Uh, first off, he's like, I, I got to tell you some more of the stuff that, that's been happening and why we decided to name the baby Asa. So they named the baby Asa. My wife and I were shocked because that's a Bible name. And we thought, to, we both said, I bet he doesn't even know that that's a Bible name or whatever. And uh, apparently they found the name in like a baby book or something. And, um, and uh, anyways, he Googled it and he found out the name means healer. And he was so worried about his son so they named him Asa, and here's where it gets crazy. My brother's talking to me on the phone, and my wife just saw the look on my face. And, and my brother, he says, so I read you know, the story of Asa in the Bible, and I saw that Asa was, a, was, was good. He was a good guy. But one of his mistakes was that when he got sick, he looked to the doctors for help, but he didn't look to God. And and my brother, I still can't believe it, my brother says to me, so at that moment, I decided that I would stop worrying myself with what I read on WebMD, and I would instead just trust him. And that's the point I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, I've never heard a family member talk this way, to refer to God in such a personal matter. I would just trust him. And um, anyways, he said, and I just got back from the doctor, and... She said that this is not what she expected at all, what was happening. And she said she doesn't need to see the baby for another six months. And, uh, and I was just like, here, here, this is my brother. He is not a believer. He's never confessed Jesus as Lord. Something is happening. But even he said, okay, you know what, I'm going to trust this. I'm going I'm to I'm I'm trust for something, and you see this in the days of Jesus. Like people who were not Jews would come to him and they would have faith and they would believe and a lot of the people who were supposed to believe didn't. And so I'm calling us as a church to believe, to believe for more, okay? To have the faith when we pray, God hears because he has sent us. Oh, there's so much more I could say on this, but I want to have time to hear at least uh, one or two of your questions. So uh, come on up, Pastor Cheryl. I think we'll just stand right there for now, Charlie. We, we don't have tons of time. We have time for two questions. Two. So if okay. you have a question in the room, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll bring the mic over. Okay. Hi, um, it's not so much a question, uh, it's more a share that's been on my heart the whole time you've been talking. Um, and I, I don't know if it'll affirm or maybe challenge some of the things you said, but um, in 2001, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive and advanced form of cancer. And I was a fairly new Christian at the time, and um, I was praying for healing and... Um, I believed intellectually God could do it, but my background was that I had a mother that had had three cancers while I was growing up, and that had died at 49 of cancer. And the other background was that in this church, we had lost two very high profile people to cancer not long before I got diagnosed. And there was a lot of prayer for those people. So in my mind, cancer just equaled death. And like I said, mine was rare and it was advanced. And so, like I was 37, I was not eager to meet the Lord in all honesty. Um, and so I was praying for healing and in my small group I was praying for healing, but I was getting a lot of, you know, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And I didn't want any of that. I, I wanted healing, but in my heart, I, I thought cancer was bigger than God. Um, I really did, in my heart of hearts, believe cancer was bigger than God. And then, it, it, there's a lot to share, but I, I know we don't have the time. Because my cancer was rare, they were harvesting the tumor for research. Um, when they took the tumor out, my tumor was dead. 
And my surgeon said, who was an atheist, next to it being um, gone, there was the next closest thing to a miracle, and he was not a believer. So it was dead, and, and that meant that my chances of surviving that were very, very good. And I guess what I want to share is just that God honored my prayers and the prayers of those around me that I allowed to pray for healing, because that's what I wanted. But I believe that he's sovereign. Like, I prayed with some degree of unbelief as well. But I believe in my situation, he wanted to show me that he's bigger than cancer. Like, when it comes to healing, we want formulas and methodology. and. But I believe that sometimes God moves and, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes that healing is, is not evidenced here on earth the way we'd like to see it but that he's just sovereign and, and that he just does what God's going to do, but that we are called to pray for these things and to ask for them like, like you did for your brother and that he moved in that circumstance and, and it's very, very powerful. Amen. Thank you for that. It is powerful. And you said something that is actually uh, uh, something I want to respond to, which is really fair. You said a couple people in, in our midst uh, passed away from cancer, people that were well known here. So what about when God doesn't heal? That's a very important thing. And this is a verse. Put, can you put the, the Daniel verse on the screen? I had it in the slides. Um, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve the gods, serve your gods, or worship the image of gold you have set up. I think about this. This is the attitude I want to have when it comes to praying for things like healing, okay? And because I feel like it, it honors, I feel like it honors the sovereignty of God, and it also encourages us to have faith. Let me explain. First, he says, if you know, I'm not going to get into the story, but basically the king was like, is your God able to rescue you if I throw you into the flames? And they were like, oh, he's able. Okay, this is God is sovereign. He is able to do it. And then the last part they say is, uh, but even if he doesn't, we're still going to trust him. We're still going to worship him. But there is a middle part that often gets missed. First, he says, he is able. Then they say, and he will. That is the faith that I want to strive for. He is able and he will. But even if he doesn't, even if the healing doesn't come, we're going to still worship. We're going to still trust him. But I want us to be a people when we pray for things like healing, we're surprised when it doesn't happen. Okay? Sometimes God's sovereign, but when I read the Bible... And it says, you know, go and believe. I want to be surprised when it doesn't happen. I don't want, for a long time, when it came to things like this, this is how I pray. I'd be like, Lord, um, I have no idea what you're going to do. But if you want to heal, do that. If not, I mean, you're sovereign. So I'm just going to leave it there. And uh, it's kind of like doing the first part and then jumping to the third part. Lord, I know he's able to, but if he doesn't, there's a middle part, isn't there? He is able. He's sovereign. By faith, he will. But even if he doesn't, okay? Even if he doesn't, there are things we don't know, there are things we don't understand. Even if he doesn't, we're going to worship. We're going to believe. And we're going to continue to pray for the sick. We're going to continue to witness. We're going to keep asking for that miracle. And... Um, <clears throat> 